Welcome to Restitutio, Simon Gathercole. I'm glad to talk with you today about your recent book, The Gospel and the Gospels. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Uh, so you studied New Testament. At, well, you are the professor of New Testament and early Christianity at the University of Cambridge, and you have degrees from Cambridge as well as Durham University, where you studied under James Dunn, the famous James Dunn. And I, I'm just curious, before we get into talking about the book a little bit more, what was that like? studying under him it, it was great uh i mean we didn't we didn't completely see eye to eye on the topic that i wrote my thesis on but uh he was very caring and loved he also loved a good argument but didn't take didn't take it personally so when we disagreed he, you know he was he was totally happy about that um so uh, we got on very very well and um and continue to get on very well until he sadly died a couple of years ago yeah yeah well, that's that's fascinating. Today, we're talking about uh, your book, and in particular, um, I was thinking this this is a big book that you've written here, <laughs> five hundred and seventy six pages, uh, hundreds of footnotes. I don't even know how many footnotes, um, and published by Erdman's. How long were you working on this project? Could you share a little bit about the sure. process? Well, um, I suppose. You could you could go all the way back to 2005. I mean, I I didn't start writing it then, but I, I, um, in 2005 I started uh, research on the Gospel of Thomas, uh, and that was inter interrupted a little bit in 2006 when the Gospel of Judas was uh, released. Uh, the manuscript was sort of unveiled to the public then, and mm -hmm. uh, the text was was made available in photographs. So I sort of had a little detour then and wrote a, a short book on the Gospel of Judas. And then, you know, working on other things like atonement uh, you know, um, and, you know, publishing two books on the Gospel of Thomas, I, I finally, in about 2015, started writing this this larger book, which was is not a not like the other ones, a sort of, you know, a single book on a single apocryphal gospel, but is uh, an attempt to survey the whole field of early christian gospels both canonical and non-canonical and so it really over the last five or six years is when i've been focused on specifically writing this book so it, it took a long time a lot of work uh and you th this book is really ha has a lot to do with these other gospels uh that didn't make it into the new testament if i could put it that way and it, it you know I, you have to forgive me if i um if I don't say everything just exactly the right way, I mean, I feel like there are so many, um, so many nuances in in the academy where you can't call them apocryphal gospels, you can't you can't call this that or whatever. Uh, but I, I've just you could just go ahead and correct me if I if I misspeak on something. But outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, just for the listeners who aren't familiar with other gospels outside of that, what what other what are these gospels and what are they like? Well, there's a big variety of apocryphal gospels, and and actually, um, last year I published a uh, a translation of over forty apocryphal gospels. Oh, wow. uh, in, in the Penguin Classics series, uh, and th those include when I say gospels, you know, using that term broadly. Sometimes when we have a fragment of something, you don't really know whether it's a gospel or a fragment of a sermon or or, or, or whatever. But, the, you know, there are a good number of gospels that are both referred to in the ancient world uh, and which we have manuscripts of today. So I, I guess some of the best known ones are the Gospel of Philip, uh, which is referred to in the Da Vinci Code, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, uh, the Gospel of Peter. Um, so the the non-canonical Gospels are often given, you know, pseudonymously the names of um, apostles um, in in a similar way to how the uh, the Gospels of Matthew and John, for example, are um, are called the Gospel according to Matthew and the Gospel according to John. And, and what are these Gospels like? I mean, why haven't people heard of them? I mean, except for the Da Vinci Code, uh, popularizing this and I, I think you have your own story about getting excited about these gospels from that from that book uh and movie uh but you know what are they like what are these what are these gospels like 
Well, they're really varied. So if you take a text like the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, um, not not the same as the Gospel, just the Gospel of Thomas, there's an Infancy Gospel as well. That's a, that's a series of stories about uh, Jesus' childhood, about how he still had, you know, already had miraculous powers when he was a, a, a boy and he turns bits of clay into birds and he uh, revives one of his friends who doesn't he off. kill him first and then yeah 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 that's right <laughs> <laughs> um but what, what one of them just falls off a falls off a off a roof um and and so some so a text like that the infancy gospel of thomas is not uh really subversive it's not um you know heretical mm. per se it's more like a pious legend whereas other types of gospels are more subversive so the gospel of judas for example deliberately sets out to disagree with the the picture in the non-canonical gospels uh, sorry in the in the biblical gospels uh and then in the middle you've got a text like the gospel of philip which both uses the new testament gospels but also disagrees with them at some points as well mm -hmm. and, and what drew you to work on these gospels because you spent so much time on them and uh someone might ask the question, well, I already have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's the point in spending time on these? Uh, what would you say to that kind of question? Well, I think they, the, the non-canonical gospels are not just big business in scholarship. They're also uh, quite in the air in the public domain. So, for example, Elaine, Elaine Pagels and Bart Ehrman have both written books about the apocryphal gospels in um you know that have got into the new york times bestsellers list uh mm -hmm. you often find uh the non-canonical gospels referred to as a sort of objection to classic christianity you know what about these other what about these other texts you know is it a vatican conspiracy that we only have the four gospels that we have in the bible and uh you know did the did the church set out to sort of burn copies of of the apocryphal gospels uh don't they have just as much of a claim to be in the bible as as matthew mark luke and john so i, th I think you know for both both in scholarship you know scholars are interested in absolutely everything but, but i think right. also in the sort of popular sphere um they they you know are known about and uh but, but well they're known about often but not really known in detail in any detail so you know some people might know the names of the gospel of thomas or the gospel of philip but not really know anything about them yeah it's almost sort of a way to defeat any kind of authority that the biblical gospels have well you could say well well there are lots of gospels who who's to say that this this is correct at least i've seen it used yeah, yeah. in that way a little bit um now let's talk about the the thesis of the book a little bit some say that uh, the four canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not special, as we've just been saying, or authoritative, but merely the ones favored by one group of Christians who managed to seize power and suppress all others. And at least in the States, everyone's obsessed with power today. Truth mm -hmm. is, is terribly out of fashion, mm -hmm. uh, but power is in and feelings. And uh, so this really kind of sits with the zeitgeist of our own time. Um, how common is this belief that uh, the canonical gospels are not special. How, how, how common is that in the academy today? Uh, could you give us a sense of the popularity of this idea? I think it is a pretty common idea. I mean, th th there's a, a movement both to, I suppose, both to rehabilitate the uh, non-canonical gospels as the sort of underdogs, the victims of history, uh -huh. and to give them you know the recognition that they perhaps deserve um and at the same time to put all the gospels on the same level playing field um, yeah, they're like the oppressed minorities exactly exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um and so you know scholars are often you know very emphatic about the fact that you know there's nothing special about matthew or john or the gospel of philip or the gospel of thomas they're all all in the same boat uh, really for, for scholarly purposes and would you say that's a majority view today 
Oh, it's it's always very hard because there are so many scholars in so many different continents, it, um, uh, you, you know, and di of different theological persuasions. It's very difficult to talk about a, mi a minority or majority view, uh -huh. um, but it's certainly a, a very popular view in certain circles. Yeah. OK, yeah. So tell us about the thesis of your book uh, just briefly. W what would you say the central? Well, I, I guess you have two theses. Uh, so uh, feel free. G give us the book in a nutshell. What were you trying to do here? Sure. Well, maybe it would be useful to, if, I, if I just read out the two theses. Yeah, which, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, 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 based on them, we can kind of get into the detail of them. So um, the, the the two theses that I explore really throughout the book and which dominate the whole the whole book are thesis one. The four New Testament Gospels share key elements of theological content that mark them out from most of the canonical Gospels. And thesis two. The reason why the New Testament Gospels are theologically similar to one another is that they, unlike most others, follow a pre-existing apostolic creed, inverted commas, or preached gospel. Mm -hmm. So the first thesis is really about, uh, it is just uh, a, a sort of an attempt to state a fact about the content of the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they have a substantial amount of important content in common with one another which other gospels tend not to um, non-canonical gospels tend not to and the second thesis is really about explaining why that is the case uh, and it's it, it's not just because you know in the fourth century uh, one group sort of dominated all the others and that's why they seized on these four gospels but it's really actually because before the gospels were written there was already a preached gospel, a proclaimed message, mm -hmm. which shapes decisively uh, what the four New Testament gospels are like, and doesn't, uh, uh, and certain other, you know, the the apocryphal gospels or non canonical gospels, you know, share some of those, some of the features of that message, some of the features of the gospel, um, but ignore others or even mm -hmm. argue against others. So those are the two the two main theses: one about content. And one and, and and thesis two explaining why that is the case. Well, let's talk about how others have done this in the past. Uh, you, you, you mentioned this in, in your introduction a little bit that uh, they uh, decided to establish authenticity or canonicity <clears throat> on the basis of early composition or how popular the gospels were, attestation or uh, the literary type of ancient bi biography or the attractiveness of that worldview. Mm. Uh, why, why are these ways of establishing the canonical gospels as in fact special? Uh, wh why did you not go with any of those approaches? You went for theological content instead. Yeah, I mean, I, d I don't disagree with the, um, the attempts to argue that the four canonical gospels are distinctive for you know for other reasons i don't really have anything against those arguments yeah um, although some of them are, some of them are stronger than others i think uh, but i think what i observed is that no one has really um done this before i guess <laughs> um that no one has argued really on the basis of theological content mm -hmm. uh, you you've you, you know people have made people made passing remarks um about to this effect but it hasn't been there hasn't been a full treatment i don't think comparing the theological content um of the four new testament gospels over against the um, non-canonical gospels comparing really i guess how they understand the how, how they understand the gospel you know mm -hmm. these are all texts which in in you know to greater or lesser degrees claim to have uh the ultimate truth um and that's not just true of the canonical gospels, but if you take the Gospel of Thomas, for example, the Gospel of Thomas begins, these are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. And whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. Wow. So the way to immortality is by uh, finding the sort of key to understanding the mysteries and having the knowledge of the uh, the true sayings of Jesus. So all of these gospels are uh, pretty much claiming to contain the 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 true that you know the absolute truth about Jesus, um, which right. results in 
in salvation however that salvation is understood and you know, they all they don't all think of salvation in exactly the same way mm-hmm. um and so that that that's partly why i chose to focus on theological content because that that ultimately is what the texts themselves are about yeah sort of taking them on your own terms there are some advantages to the strategy that you adopted here uh as far as uh the, the sort of pre-existence of the kerygma to the writing of the Gospels. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. You call the kerygma a comparator, and you have this comparison language throughout the book. Um, what, what, um, what, what would you say, well, give us a definition of the kerygma first. Like, what, what does the word kerygma mean? Obviously, that's not an English word. Uh, and uh, how did you use that concept throughout the book? Sure. The, the word kerygma is a Greek word, and it, it derives from the verb keruso or keruto to proclaim. It's not it's, it's not a special Christian word. It's a it's a normal word which anyone might use about a message, uh, whether it's a message that the Athenians have won a battle or whether it's a message that Christ has died for your sins. <laughs> so so it's a it's a it's a word which means uh, a message, and um, Paul uses you know words about words connected to it frequently Mm -hmm. uh new testament authors um you know all use the you know often use the the verb to proclaim uh and so the kerygma is really a way in which scholars have talked about the original message of the apostles um what you know so there have been lots of attempts by scholars to define what the gospel was uh, for the for the early earliest christians and so the, the way i go about this is to uh find one particular place in paul uh where where paul explicitly states that he is reporting what the gospel is so in 1 corinthians 15 paul talks about the um the gospel by which the corinthians are saved and then he goes on to explain what that gospel is uh that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried that he rose again according to the scriptures and that he appeared to um various people after that so in, so i suppose i focus on what i regard as four central elements in that message namely that that jesus is the christ mm-hmm. the subject of that sentence is the, is christ the messiah um secondly that this christ died for our sins so that there's a saving death that the, the messiah goes through um thirdly there's a the the resurrection on the third day is also a key uh component of the gospel it's not just about jesus death it's all equally about his resurrection as well and finally in 14 and finally that this all takes place according to the scriptures so those are the sort of four key elements of the kerygma of the early christian message that i identify that jesus is the christ saving death saving resurrection and all uh in accordance with the scriptures and then, then I go on to sort of sort of explain how this isn't really, this isn't just an eccentric bit of Paul's preaching, mm-hmm. uh, but it's something that's actually shared across the New Testament. Uh, you, you know, I could have gone further into the second century and looked at people like Ignatius and the um, the Ascension of Isaiah and other texts where uh, these four elements are, you know, very prominent. Um, but the other New Testament authors like Hebrews, 1 Peter, Revelation, are all emphatic about the importance of Jesus being Messiah, saving right. death, saving resurrection, all according to the scriptures. So that's how I identify the the early Christian kerygma. Right. So that's your, your criteria of, uh, I won't say criteria of authenticity, I'll get myself in trouble with that, <laughs> but uh, that's your criteria of comparison, your comparator. And yeah. uh, you're going to then, throughout the book, measure uh matthew mark luke and john but also these other gospels how many other gospels did you do was it like seven seven yeah yeah Yeah. seven other gospels in addition to the four um and measure each up against that kerygma measuring stick if you will Mm -hmm. uh to see how they how they each do uh now before we look at your results of this this uh research i want to ask you uh if you've had much pushback on identifying the kerygma as just those four things, like there are other facts about Jesus contained in the gospels, like, I don't know, an event, say the triumphal entry or Mm -hmm. that he healed people 
you know, wh why exclude those uh, or other kinds of common ground uh, or his his teaching about the kingdom of God, for example? Uh, what what was your thinking there in excluding other items that maybe could also be used? Yeah, I, I, I suppose it's partly a practical one. It's partly um you know, going with at least one place <clears throat> where uh, an early Christian sets out to explain what 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 the gospel is in a in a very sort of brief summary fashion. Um, so uh, I guess there are lots of things that one could say are true about Jesus, but which aren't necessarily uh, good news. So so or. or <laughs> which aren't necessarily the good news right uh, so the the triumphal entry um is is never picked up as far as i know by an early christian author as a kind of saving event right in, its, in itself um so or the feeding of the five thousand, you know something that appears yeah. in all four yeah. gospels so, right so yeah yeah so the, the, it's, it's obviously a very important um event and I think a lot of the events, in, I mean, I do I do say quite a bit about the events that take place in the Gospels um, as signs of Jesus' messiahship, as as sort of indicators of the kind of messiah that he is. Um, but an event like this, the feeding of the 5000, important as it is, uh, is, is never picked up by early Christians as uh, as a kind of decisive um, event, which um reveals a salvation which is a saving event for everyone it was a very important event for those five thousand people <laughs> and it was a very important um, um event for the gospel writers as a as a sign as an indication mm -hmm. of the kind of messiah that jesus is um but it it's not given a kind of an, an independent importance um uh, as far as salvation is concerned does that does that make sense yeah yeah I, what I hear you saying is is partly methodological uh because finding that little summary you know that that statement in first Corinthians 15 is uh is, is so fascinating and apologists have have done so much with that over the years to uh, make the case that that's such an early, uh, early creed that Paul had received and then passed on, and now he's reminding them of it again. And still, First Corinthians is, is an incredibly early document. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you can backdate that information um, to uh, probably his time in Jerusalem. Uh, so it's really a fascinating little corner of the, the New Testament to work with uh, as far as uh, a kernel that then is repeated and memorized and, you know, even just like the formulaic uh, language, especially in the Greek. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely hear what you're saying there. And then, you know, these other events like his healing ministry or the triumphal entry, they're all, they're all occur in service to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. What kind of a Messiah is he? Let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about your, your four <laughs> components a little bit. Um, how did you go about seeing Jesus as Messiah, especially in, let, let's say, for Mark to to start? Yeah, well, I, I suppose the first th the first thing to say is that uh, Mark is absolutely emphatic about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, um, and so it's, it's striking when you compare Mark with some of the apocryphal gospels, like like the Gospel of Judas, to take one example, uh, or even the Gospel of Thomas. Um, where you have gospel texts which don't refer to Jesus as Messiah at all. Um, you know, whereas Mark, you, almost certainly the earliest of the gospels, is emphatic about this fact, you know, the first line of Mark, uh, Mark's gospel is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, Christos, the Christ. Well, Christu, because it's in the genesis, but um, um, <laughs> that Jesus is the Messiah in the first line of the book. Right. And then when you get to the middle, you know, there aren't masses and masses of references to Jesus as the Messiah, but they do occur in important places like that first line. And then in the Caesar of Philippi incident where Jesus says to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And the answer, which looks very much like the correct answer, you are the Christ, um, Peter replies. 
Um, so Mark is really uh, emphatic about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. It occurs right at the beginning and then um, at that midpoint. Um, and in terms of the sort of Messiah that Jesus is, one of the things that we 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 see um, in early early Jewish early Jewish texts, and there are lots of uh, discussions of the Messiah in early Jewish literature, uh, is that the the definition of a Messiah always comes about by some kind of biblical interpretation. There is, um, you know, various uh, Old Testament texts are employed to create a picture of the Messiah, either either in anticipation of what the Messiah is going to look like, or in retrospect. Um, so in the case of Simon bar Kokhba, this happens as well. Um, some, who was regarded by Messiah by some of the rabbis, a second century figure who led a revolt against the Rome, Romans in 132 to 135 uh, AD. He, he, he is called by some a Messiah and that m messianic identity that Simon bar Kokhba was, was given by some is defined in scriptural terms. And it's the same with Jesus. So when we come to the, the baptism, again you know only a few verses into mark um we probably have a reference there to psalm 2 you are my son um where where as 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 god says to um to to jesus and so psalm 2 is the use of psalm 2 immediately triggers the you know the the fact that ah oh, this is this is this is the davidic messiah um but who has some kind of special relation to god even beyond being a king uh, at, just as uh, in Psalm two is a a, a, a text which is um, already used in early Judaism as a messianic proof text, yeah, so sort of not... indisputably messianic. Yeah, so even psalm... has the word anointed there in exactly the, in the yeah. psalm. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And so the, yeah, which is which is probably what you know prompted it to become used in messianic mm -hmm. contexts by the Psalms of Solomon, for example. Um, to take one example, a first century BC um, uh, set of psalms, uh, the last two of which are strongly messianic. Um, yeah, so 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 that's just one example of how Mark uses scripture to define the kind of Messiah that Jesus is. Yeah, um, and uh, let me ask you about John for a second, just to shift gears. Uh, talk talk to us about how John describes Jesus as Messiah, because John obviously is a little different than the synoptics. Um, and then uh, maybe contrast that with the Gospel of Thomas a little bit on, sure. this, on this topic of Jesus as Christ or Messiah. Yeah, that's a good, quite good, good, good way of putting the question, because sometimes scholars say that, well, the synoptics are quite like each other and John and Thomas are quite like. Yeah, <laughs> but I actually I, I, I think the, the 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 real picture is very different. You know, John shares with the synoptics an absolute emphasis on Jesus being Messiah. Mm -hmm. So in John 20, John tells us why he you know the purpose of his gospel is you know jesus did many other things that are not written this in this book but these are written down so that you may believe that jesus is the messiah the christ um the son of god and that by believing you may have life in his name so you know he's setting out his purpose of writing a gospel for salvation and the key way of understanding christ is understanding jesus in john is as the christ the son of god and um, that sort of those two titles sort of squashed together there mm -hmm. so john is absolutely absolutely emphatic about um jesus identity as the as the christ and that's very different from the gospel of thomas because the gospel of thomas doesn't mention the title christ at all which is which which is supr quite surprising i think yeah to, uh, um to have an early christian text or a text that purports to be a christian text which doesn't call jesus messiah um but understands jesus in other terms like thomas does use the title son and son of god uh or not son of god per se but you know he's the son of the father um but the, again thomas doesn't use the whole scriptural framework to explicate the kind of figure that jesus is whereas again john uh understands jesus messiahship 
in terms that are derived from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So one one passage, for example, that John uses is the suffering servant passage mm -hmm. um, that the um, that that Jesus is high and lifted up, just like the servant in Isaiah fifty two to fifty three, um, and again. Isaiah 53 is a passage which is sometimes used um, before that use used in the um, in the parables of Enoch or the similitudes of Enoch, first century BC, first century AD text uh, to depict the exaltation of the Messiah. Right. I was, so, I was going to add, push back on that a little bit because uh, I think many modern Jews would, would say, what do you what do you what does Isaiah 52, 53 have to do with being a Messiah? Uh, but yeah, there, I think but, there is evidence that some people did think of the suffering servant songs as messianic texts. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it, it's very strong in the um, in the uh, in one Enoch or the similitudes of Enoch, um, and it's also very strong in the Targum uh, of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I think you, you can see quite a lot of ele elements actually in common between the way Isaiah fifty three is used in the Targum. And that's the um the aramaic paraphrase of 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 isaiah uh and one enoch which also uses um uses isaiah 53 in a, a strongly messianic fashion yeah i i really found your approach to talking about christ fascinating uh not that it was radical or just mm -hmm. out of this world or anything but uh that the tendency to use Old Testament text to talk about Messiah and then analyzing which texts that each of the different gospels used. Uh, mm. What did you find in these other gospels like uh, Philip or, or Judas or, or whatever, mm. you know, did they, did they use Old Testament texts to establish their, the messianic portrait or identity? Yeah. I, I just, just before I answer, I should credit uh, Matt Novenson uh, with the, with, with, um, making that point really really clearly and in his two books one on christ and the messiah in paul and one on one called the grammar of messianism by matthew novinson uh he 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 really shows uh very clearly how important scripture is for the defining de defining the nature of the messiah i think it, it it's the, it's therefore very striking that you know given the fact that in you know, early Jewish literature, in rabbinic literature, uh, in the New Testament and uh, other early Christian literature, you know, the, the scripture is always used to define the Messiah. It's therefore very striking when you come to 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 some apocryphal books, apocryphal gospels, where there's really no reference to scripture at all. So I've mentioned the Gospel of Thomas, which doesn't refer to um, to Jesus as Christ. It also has a, quite a negative view of what we would call the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Yeah. So the Gospel of Thomas, uh, at one point, there's a dialogue. It's this Gospel of Thomas saying, um, saying 52, where the disciples ask, you know, are, are, were the were the prophets in Israel prophesying about you? And Jesus replies, you have spoken only about the dead, whereas the living one is standing in front of you. Mm. So the 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 prophets are just you know the Old Testament authors or the prophets are just characterized as spiritually dead 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 in the Gospel of Thomas is not just a statement about biology it's a a spiritual condition um, so the Gospel of Thomas doesn't you know really not only sort of neglects the Old Testament but actually polemicizes against it yeah um, you get a similar polemic against the Old Testament in the Gospel of the Egyptians. Um, where the gospel of the Egyptians reveals the truth, which neither the the preachers nor the apostles nor the prophets knew about. Um, uh, the gospel of Judas defines Jesus in terms which have nothing to do with the Old Testament. Um, the gospel of truth, again, hardly refers to the Old Testament. You know, has one possible allusion to the Old Testament, but not really in a, as a description of Jesus. Um, and what, I suppose one of the one of the most um, striking cases of this is Marcion's gospel. Yeah. Um, Marcion is, 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 you know, is quite a well-known Christian heretic in, in scholarly circles. Mm -hmm. um, and you sometimes find a slight misrepresentation of Marcion, that Marcion was not interested in the Old Testament. Marcion was actually really interested in the Old Testament, but he regarded the, the Old Testament 
as telling a story of a different God from the God of Jesus. Um, so Marcion actually thinks that there are two messiahs. One who's the it gets messiah. complicated. <laughs> yeah, it gets complicated. One who's the messiah of the creator God, the Jewish messiah, who's going to come and restore uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, and then there's Jesus, who has nothing to do with the Old Testament. The, the Jesus who comes, uh, um, uh, you know, in the, in the New Testament or in his in his gospel uh, is, you know, just comes out of clear blue sky, mm -hmm. is self-interpreting uh, rather than in, to be interpreted in terms of the Old Testament. Uh, and he's actually he's actually acting in opposition to the creator God um in the course of the gospel narrative so uh we we've got you know various different ways in which the old testament is treated the the gospel of truth it pretty much ignores the old testament all the, altogether um the gospel of the egyptians and the gospel of thomas sort of polemicize against the old testament uh, marcion has a com completely different um take on it right right he's, he's a little more sci-fi yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always uh, think of like the the Gnostics, which uh, I'm not saying Marcion's a Gnostic, but you know the later uh, like Sethian Gnostics and stuff is is uh, like sci-fi novels with too many characters to keep track yeah. of, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I don't I don't think we'll have time to to go thoroughly into all the all the four components here because you know the the book is dense. Uh, and uh, people should buy it if they want to know more about it, right? Um, but you talk about the vicarious death of Jesus um, and establish the case uh, very easily, I think, that uh, the canonical Gospels do make this uh, a big part mm -hmm. of their description of, of Jesus, not just, uh, you know, about him in general, but narrating the the rest trial crucifixion of jesus and so on mm -hmm. and so on and so forth and, you know john of course gets a little more flowery uh because we have uh behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world i mean right up front yeah. uh so john john is not uh going in a, a gnostic or an anti-realist or docetic direction uh no. as, as some have uh accused in the past um he's he's right in line and then you talk about the resurrection and then the fulfillment of scripture as uh, you were kind of merging the, the, the one about Christ and the fulfillment of scripture together there, which I think is great because, you know, he's, he's Christ according to the scriptures. He's died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, yeah. you know, in first Corinthians 15 there. So I think it's, that's totally fair. Um, and you're, you're able to make this, this case about, these four gospels in particular being uh being special um was there anything that surprised you in doing this research as far as the the non-canonical gospels on these four points yeah i i think one thing which i hadn't really appreciated when i first went into this was that um that some of the apocryphal gospels uh are actually quite interested in in jesus death as a saving event mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I suppose you can have a caricature of, of of apocryphal gospels in which Jesus is not not a physical being; he's just a disembodied spirit, which is, you know, is the case in some in some uh, um, of the more obst obscure texts. It, it is the case, for example, in the Gospel of Judas. But in the in in the um, Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of of Truth, for example, um, they, they those two two texts are both. Um, very strong on the fact that Jesus' death is a saving event. Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're not um, they don't belong to uh, the sort of hard hardcore Gnostic, uh, the Sethian Gnostics or the classical Gnostic mm -hmm. sects. Um, but they owe their sort of theology to uh, a teacher called Valentinus, and Valentinus didn't have a kind of very strict dichotomy or dualism between mater matter and um be 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 between sort of material flesh and spirit uh he thought that matter was you know an illusion of some kind um but he didn't regard it as 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 completely evil in the way that um that 
sort of proper Gnostics did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so Jesus really took on a body. He really died. And through the process of of, of that death, he um, revealed the truth of the cosmos to um, to his followers. And in the destruction of his flesh, the illusion of the of the cosmos is shattered. And so uh, in the gospel of truth, there's, you know, pretty strong emphasis on uh, Jesus death as saving. I, I, I'd say the same thing, I think, as well with Marcion's gospel. It's a bit hard with Marcion's gospel because it's reconstructed. And so we don't always know exactly what Marcion says. But uh, elsewhere, um reports about marcion are very strong about the fact that um um marcion loves galatians right you know galatians is Mar- is is almost more important than the gospel for than the gospel text for marcion and in galatians 3 of course we have christ redeem redeeming us and marcion is very interested in the fact that christ's death is a kind of purchase of human souls from the creator god um and so uh, that I think flows over into the gospel text because, you know, just as the you know, Marcion's gospel is a kind of synoptic gospel based on the gospel of Luke, and he retains from uh, from Luke the the idea that Jesus' flesh and blood are given uh, for his followers as an institution of the covenant. Um, so 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 Marcion too is is also interested in the fact that you know despite his funny theology of Jesus being Messiah you know two messiahs and mm-hmm. hostility to the Creator God he 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 is quite strong on the fact that Christ's death is a saving event yeah so that, yeah that, that's one of the main things I think that um, I learned as I was going through yeah you, you might maybe have been expecting these other gospels to just totally disregard the death of Christ. Uh-huh. And in fact, some of them made a big deal about it. So that's yeah. So, so yeah, it's interesting. I, I, my book is my book certainly isn't arguing that you know the gospel, the four canonical gospels have the full blown charisma, and all the other gospels don't have any of it. You know, it's right. not, the argument isn't like that at all. It's yeah. it's much more much more nuanced than that. Right. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you about the reception of of this book so far. Um, how how have you know, certainly uh, evangelicals are very excited to have this book and, you know, it's it's defending the biblical gospels. So uh, let's just kind of set them to the side. They're going to like it anyhow. We already know that. Uh, what about in the academy? What about among more uh, critical and skeptical uh, scholars? How has, uh, how have they pushed back? How have they received the book? Or is it just too early to tell right now? Yeah, it's, it, the book's only just come out actually last month, so I think it, it you, it'll be over the next year or or even two that reviews come out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I I deliberately set out, you know, not just to get um, evangelical scholars to write the blurb on the back of the book. So there, are, you know, there are very sort of mainstream figures like Jörg Fry, uh, Jens Schröter, who who've written um, who are evangelish but not evangelical if you know what i mean they're probably yeah. who are protestant but not evangelical um also well, sandra hubenthal who's a catholic um um so so um i hope the i hope the book will not just be um you know will not just be written for one tribe uh, but will gather sort of scholarly attention more broadly yeah well, I, I know that there are going to be some scholars coming after you for this. Oh, uh, sure. Because yeah, yeah. I mean, you you <laughs> you definitely took on you know like Bart Ehrman is is such a sensationalist and uh, he's just so good at selling books. Um, but uh, um, you know, this is really a corrective to his extremist position on you know these other gospels as being perfectly equivalent. Uh, even my in my own education at Boston University, I. Um, I think the name of the, one of my classes was varieties of early Christianity. And it, it was just like taken for granted that all of the different versions of Christianity are completely equivalent and one should not be privileged over the other because yeah. they ended up becoming more popular later on. And, you know, I, I think there is some value to that, uh, to yeah. looking at, um, you know, you think of like Rome in the second century, you've got Justin Martyr, Valentinus, you've got, um, you know, all these different 
positions and perspectives uh, that are all in the same city at the same time. And, yeah. you know, they don't have some big institution to clobber each other. You know, they have to just use persuasion. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that, I think that's, I think that's fine. But then uh, I think to say all gospels are equivalently valid for historical sources. Now I'm going to have a problem, you know, because uh, some of them do seem really, uh, unreliable historically or late or exaggerated or obviously subject to uh, just uh, a, a strong agenda mm -hmm. or, or theology that's, that's coloring things. So I, I think your work here is really, really does provide that, uh, I don't know if I would call it objective, but s some sort of like uh, really measurable way of classifying these, these four gospels mm -hmm. as, as unique. Mm -hmm. uh, among, you know, what'd you say, 40 in your recent translation? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a huge number. And those are, those are the ones we know. There could be even more that didn't yeah. survive. Um, so uh, I really appreciate what you're, what you're doing here. Uh, what, would you, what would you hope to see as far as an impact of the book in, the, uh, in academic circles and in universities? Well, I think one, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I suppose um in some ways it's it's maybe unrealistic for any scholar to expect to persuade his you, you know his own colleagues and um because you know by the time you get to to middle age you're fairly sort of set in your mental pathway pathways and um but I, but i certainly hope it would provide a platform you know for um for 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 you know the next i was going to say the next generation but you know the next generation of scholars is you know, a generation of scholars is like probably 10 years because, <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, super, I, I, my PhD students are not much younger than, than I am. Uh, um, so, so I certainly hope that, you know, the next round of scholarship over the next 10 or 20 years might be, um, more, uh, open to the idea that, uh, the four gospels are, uh, are theologically distinctive. Yeah. And, um, what would you say to somebody who asks the question, well, what do I need to know any of this for? I, I already believe in the Bible. Uh, what's the point in engaging in this kind of uh, research? Well, I think for, for ordinary Christians, uh, you, you know, unless you live in a kind of Christian enclave, um, you're going to come up against, you know, lots of arguments about mm -hmm. lots of anti-Christian arguments, aren't you? Whether it's you know, how can God, God be omnipotent and all loving, but allow suffering? Um, doesn't science, you, you know, give a more compelling explanation of, of our origins than the book of Genesis? You know, lot, lots of, you know, lots of Christians encounter all the time uh, objections to Christianity. And, and one of them, one of one of them that I've come across a lot is that uh the, the the bible is is basically a kind of arbitrary collection of texts um that are put in place as you uh, you know as you implied at, at the beginning um by a powerful uh ecclesiastical elite um who 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 sought to suppress all other forms of christianity and i suppose i i, I suppose this you know one thing for for one one knock and effect for ordinary christians i think is to to show that um the the four gospels aren't simply uh um you, you know canonical because of power relations but because they have a genuine claim to go back to the original theology of the apostles and therefore of jesus himself um so 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 that that i think is why having at least some knowledge i mean you know i'm not saying every christian should read this book by any means um I wouldn't inflict that on on anyone let alone everyone um but um to have some not have some sort of basic knowledge um of what what's going on in the apocryphal gospels is useful just as just as having some basic knowledge of science is useful um if you're if you're responding to objections about um objections to christianity on a scientific basis yeah, I think if you're a Christian who's taking your faith seriously, you have some responsibility for the Great Commission and yeah. reaching people, making disciples uh, in, you know, certainly in my neck of the woods, which is probably pretty similar to where you are. Mm. Uh, I live in a very post-Christian area. Um, 
we, the, the upstate New York areas where I live near Albany. And um, it's been identified by Barna as the most post-Christian uh, city in the United States. So I thought right. to myself, wow, what a great place to be a pastor. Yeah, uh, I was going to say congratulations, <laughs> but I'm not sure if that's the yeah. right word. <laughs> yeah, still, like, it, it looks like the Bible Belt compared to England. So uh, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, uh, I thought, you know, what a great place to be a pastor. But at the same time, it does take more effort. Mm. Because when you when you encounter people, everything is up for grabs. And everyone has kind of a Hollywood impression of the Bible or of you know, like uh, the, we mentioned the Da Vinci Code, uh, pe people have this sense, like you said, that, oh, yeah, there are other Gospels, too. Who's to say that this this collection of four is legitimate? So uh, I really appreciate your approach. I think it's really um, I think it's really compelling for a non-believer to ask the question, well, as a historian, you know, even just starting with that phrase as a historian, uh, what we can gather from the earliest Christians is that they believed, whether it's true or not, they believed Jesus is the Messiah or Jesus is the Christ. Um, he died for their sins. He was raised from the dead. And, you know, they had this, this idea about dependence on the Hebrew Bible or on, on the Septuagint, at least, you know, the, the scriptures. And, you know, you can establish that in, in just a conversation with somebody pretty easily. Mm. And uh, say, now, when we come to these, all, all these different gospels, you know, all in, let's say 40, uh, which one of these line up with the earliest information we have about the proclamation of Jesus mm. or about Jesus, right? Uh, so, you know, I think it is a, I think it is a compelling strategy. And so I, I appreciate you, uh, you bringing that. Uh, do you, do you already have an idea of, of what's next for you? Or are you just sort of basking in the, uh, the post publishing <laughs> glory here? Yeah, just just to pick up on what you just said, but before I before I answer sure. the question, I, I'm 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 really glad about that because I, I I guess there's a responsibility for for pastors, you know, to yeah. to set aside the time to to you know to read a book like this, you know, even if not every not every I don't mean every pastor should read it, but I'm I'm glad that I'm really glad that you've read it because you you can then equip others to be able to answer these objections. Uh, you know when um you know ordinary christians wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily have the the time or the expertise to get into it um in terms of in terms of next project yeah i I've, I've got a sabbatical now to try and work out what to do next and i'm probably going to do something on the question uh of how much jesus and the new testament authors thought that the end was imminent oh which is oh, that which would is be great well, I've often puzzled over and would like to find the answer to. So oh, that's yes. another that's another Airman uh, hobby horse right there. <laughs> Not just him either. Uh, no, it's it's a very dominant. The, the whole the whole stream, you know, from uh, uh, Schweitzer uh, yeah. forward. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow, that would be great. You know, how, did did he really think it was the end? Did he think it was? him him being present you know what does it mean at hand there when he mm -hmm. claims about the kingdom yeah that'd yeah. be that'd be a fascinating work uh work well thanks for taking the time to talk with me today um where can Best people go me. to find out more about you and about the book well i mean the book you can just get on amazon the gospel and the gospels um and uh, there's also also the other book um i mentioned um the apocryphal gospels oh yeah um which is um, how, how many pages is that sure. one? well this is it's uh, it's about 400 pages but it's very cheap as well it's like ten dollars on amazon wow. um, or, or from barnes and noble or, or where, wherever you buy your books um and this is this is the translation of all all the 40 gospels i mentioned earlier um so although it's 400 pages you can just dip it in and out you know read little bits of it at a time in a way that you, you know is a bit more difficult with with this one <laughs> yeah yeah all right well uh thanks so much for talking with me today thanks thanks for having me Sean.